Hello, welcome to another one of my videos about designing and building a camper van. This one's gonna be about propane, also called liquid petroleum or LP gas. So do you need a propane system for your van? Maybe. In mine, I used it for our stovetop and our heater. In general, you'll find a propane system in most RVs in North America. There are alternatives though, more common in some areas, and I'll talk about that at the end. In this video, I'll first overview the propane system in my van, then we'll get into the nitty gritty of what you need to know to design and install a propane system for your van, going over things like tank options and plumbing details, and then at the end, I'll give some of my thoughts on what it might look like to have a diesel or gasoline setup as an alternative to propane. All right, let's go. Let me give a quick disclaimer first. I'm not a propane or plumbing professional. I'm just sharing what I've learned and a summary of my research. Please follow common safety practices and all regulations for where you live. Don't install your own system if you aren't comfortable with it. If you do, consider having a professional review your installation afterwards. So now let me go over what my propane system looks like. I have a 20 pound propane tank stored inside a vented locker. Later, We'll compare this against other tank options, like mounting a tank underneath the van. A regulator connects to the tank to control the flow of propane coming out of the tank, and then the rest of the plumbing connects from there. In my case, it branches to two places, my Propex HS2000 heater, which is located at the bottom of this cabinet, and my two burner stovetop, which is located at the top of this cabinet. And that's about the extent of my propane system. Besides heaters and stoves, the other common thing people like to heat is water. So many camper vans and RVs also include a hot water heater. This becomes more of a necessity if you are also incorporating a shower, whether it's indoors or out, but I didn't in my van. Propane hot water heaters need lots of ventilation to exhaust the combustion fumes, but also because the unit itself generates a lot of heat. RV specific propane hot water heaters are usually installed by cutting a rather large opening into the side of the vehicle. Another option you'll see is a tankless heater mounted on or near the rear door of the van to be used for an outdoor shower. And in this case, the hot water heater is really only meant to be operated while the rear doors are open. Now, let's move on to designing a system. Let's talk about propane tanks first. There are two main types of tanks, horizontal undermount tanks and vertical cylinders. Horizontal undermount tanks are commonly found under RVs. In the US, these are also sometimes called ASME tanks. These tanks are designed to mount underneath a vehicle and come in various sizes, ranging from five to six gallons up to 20 or 30 gallons. On most vans, you can probably only fit a tank that's on the smaller end of this range. There are a couple big advantages to undermount tanks. Firstly, they don't take up any space inside the van. Secondly, if the tank is underneath the van, then the majority of the plumbing can also be underneath the van. This means if anything leaks, the leak will most likely be on the outside. Propane is heavier than air, so it'll just drop to the ground, which is much better than if anything leaks inside your van where it's trapped and contaminating the air you're breathing. Now for the disadvantages. These kind of tanks can be expensive, ranging from $300 to $600 just for the tank itself. Depending on your van and what all is underneath it, these can also be trickier to install. Vans like the ProMaster, which are front wheel drive and have fewer components running underneath to the rear wheels, are a little better suited for mounting things underneath. Remember though, that anything you mount underneath can reduce the ground clearance of the vehicle. Finally, undermount tanks, depending on where they are placed, can be harder to get filled and you may need to purchase a remote fill kit, which is essentially an extension tube and valves that allow the tank to be filled without having to climb underneath the van. Without this, some propane fill stations may refuse to fill a hard to reach tank. The other category of tanks are vertical cylinders. These also get called dot cylinders. The most common tank, which you see all over in the US, are the 20 pound tanks used for campers, gas grills, and bunches of other stuff. And that's what I used in my van. A 20 pound tank holds about 4.7 gallons of propane. 
You can also find this style of tank in a variety of different sizes. A 20 pound tank will cost just under $40. These tanks are easy to fill. You just disconnect them and walk them up to a filling station. There are also tons of stores that have exchanges for these, where you can swap out the empty tank for a full one. Refilling them instead of exchanging them is a little cheaper and you actually get a little more propane. Sometimes though, it's easier to find a place with a tank exchange than it is to find a filling station. So it's nice that that's an option. If you're putting a tank like this inside your van, it's important that you build in a vented locker for it. More on the how and why of this in just a second. The disadvantage of having a tank inside your van is it takes up space inside. You'll also probably want to locate the vented locker for a tank in an easy to access area, like near the rear doors or the side door, because these tanks are pretty heavy and this will make it easier to get it out when you need to take it to get filled up. But also think about where the propane appliances are going to be located. If you end up locating your tank on the opposite end of the van from where your propane appliances are, remember that it's still an option to run the propane lines under the van, even if the tank's inside. In my case, I had everything real close together, so I didn't need to do this. It's also possible to do a simple setup using one pound propane canisters. These little propane tanks are commonly used to fuel camp stoves. There are refillable versions of one pound tanks as well, but mostly you see the pre-filled one-time tanks, which will create a lot of waste if you're using them frequently. For cooking only, using a camp stove and a one pound tank is a pretty economical option. If you also want to use propane for a heat source, then you'll probably want to consider a bigger tank so you aren't having to constantly swap out these little tanks. Let's go back to vented lockers. If you are putting a propane tank inside your van, it should go in a vented locker. I believe the concept of vented lockers originally comes from sailboats, where mounting a tank underneath isn't an option like it is for RVs. And people have adapted this idea to using camper vans. Both the propane tank itself and the propane regulator have pressure relief mechanisms that will vent propane in the event of excess pressure buildup. This is a safety feature which prevents something worse from happening like the tank rupturing but it means that either of these can potentially vent propane inside your van. The solution is to build a box which is sealed off from the rest of the interior space, but has a vent in the bottom which passes through the floor of the van. As I said before, propane is heavier than air, so you'll want the vent in the bottom. A three quarter inch diameter hole is sufficient for this. In the US, there aren't strict guidelines on this, especially for DIY conversions. Due to this, you see many photos, even some from professional upfitters, which have a propane tank just under the kitchen cabinet or under the bed. And this just isn't a great idea. If you really want to be safe, then put the tank in a vented locker if it's inside the van. No matter what you do, install a propane alarm at floor level near your tank. The alarm will alert you if anything starts leaking. The next noteworthy component in the propane system, which attaches to the tank, is the propane regulator. The regulator controls the flow of propane coming out of the tank and ensures the propane flowing to the appliances is at the correct pressure. The propane coming out of the tank is at a very high pressure, and the regulator reduces it to a lower pressure. In the US, you'll see that most regulators are fixed at a pressure of 11 inches of water column, but be sure that the output pressure of your regulator matches the required pressure of the appliances you're installing. You will see two kinds of regulators, single stage and two stage regulators. Two stage regulators do a better job providing a consistent pressure regulation. For stoves and cooktops, variations in the pressure regulation won't matter much, but for propane heaters, they can be a bit more sensitive. So I went with a two stage regulator. The first regulator I bought for my van actually failed after a few months, so I have a bit of a story to go with that. We were parked for the night at the base of Towski Valley, which is at a fairly high elevation, and the low for the night was 12 degrees. We cooked dinner in the van, and the stove worked fine, but then a little bit after that, the heater started acting up. And by the time we were going to bed, it was pretty clear that our heater wasn't working. 
I thought the issue was with the heater itself, which was pretty concerning for me, but after searching around the web, I got suspicious that the regulator was the issue. That night, it got cold in the van without the heater running, but not terrible. The thermometer mounted about midway up the wall, read just under 50 degrees by morning, but at the very back corner of the van, right by the water tank, um, it was close to freezing and one of the water lines like right by the floor froze a little bit. In the morning though, we were able to head into town. I bought a new regulator at an Ace Hardware, replaced it in the parking lot, and the heater fired back up just fine after that. The regulator I had that failed was made by Camco, and from the Amazon reviews, it seems that many people have had these fail on them. So make sure you buy a good regulator, and it might even be wise to carry a spare regulator in the winter. Um, it only takes a few tools to swap them out. Okay, so we have the tank, then the regulator. Then the rest of the plumbing starts from here. For the plumbing, let's talk about the tubing and the fittings. There are two kinds of tubing you can use, copper and propane rated rubber hose. I ended up with a mix of both in my system. The regulator connects with the rubber hose so it can be moved out of the way when changing the tank. I also needed the flexibility of rubber hose to ease the install of the appliances. For the rest of the plumbing though, I used copper tubing. The type of copper tubing you want for this is called soft copper refrigeration coil tubing. I used 3 8 inch diameter tubing for the majority of my system, except for one small section of one quarter inch required to connect to the fitting on the heater. Working with the copper tubing is pretty simple. It can be cut with a pipe cutter, and if needed, bent with a bending tool. You have to be careful that you don't kink the tubing when bending it, and that's why a special tool is needed. I didn't need to add any bends to my copper pipe, but I did use some 90 degree elbows for sharp turns. If you have any long runs of copper pipe, you wanna make sure they are secured and supported with a cushioned pipe clamp or tube strap. This is to prevent the tube from rubbing or chafing against something which could damage it over time. Another type of flexible tubing for gas lines is CSST, or corrugated stainless steel tubing. It's usually wrapped with a like yellow PVC exterior. You'll see this in residential installations, but you should avoid this in a camper. This stuff is flexible and bends easily, but it's not very durable. It isn't meant to be rebent or for constant movement, as it can become brittle and crack. So stick with copper pipe or propane rated rubber hose for your van. Next up, fittings. The tubing and hoses connect together with various fittings. There are three main types, flared, compression, and NPT. All of these are usually made from brass. In North America, flared fittings are the most common for gas connections. Flared fittings seal very well and can withstand the vibrations in a vehicle, making them a solid choice for your camper. To install a flare fitting, first cut the pipe to length, making sure the end is clean and free of burrs. Next, slide the flare nut over the tube. Now we will attach the flaring tool to flare the end to a 45 degree angle. After the end is flared, you can thread the flare nut onto the fitting. Now you can tighten it up and we're done. Don't over tighten the fitting. And don't forget to check for leaks once all the fittings have been connected. In the UK and Europe, compression fittings are standard in campers. Some people believe that compression fittings don't seal as well and are more likely to loosen with the vibrations in a vehicle. But as long as you use good quality fittings and install them properly, Compression fittings should work fine as well. The Propex heater I installed in my van came with a compression fitting on the end for connecting it to one quarter inch copper tubing. I used this compression fitting since it was supplied with the heater, but opted for flared or NPT fittings everywhere else. NPT stands for National Pipe Taper. NPT fittings are pretty standard and suitable for gas connections. When using these, you either want to use thread sealant or thread tape on the threads. Make sure the thread sealant or thread tape is for gas connections. The thread tape you want is the yellow PTFE tape. 
This is thicker than the white Teflon tape, which is for water, not gas connections. Couple more notes on plumbing. A cutoff valve should be added to any line that branches off the main line. This will also make it easier to find leaks or make repairs or changes later. Another cutoff that some people install is a solenoid valve on the low pressure side of the regulator. A solenoid valve is a valve that is controlled with electricity. This means you could place the valve inside your sealed locker, but have a switch for controlling it on the outside. The nice thing about this is that it provides an easy way to cut off the propane to the whole system without having to access the tank and close it from its valve. This is a nice safety feature. The downside though is the additional power these draw. A typical solenoid valve for a gas line uses no power when the valve is closed, but requires power to hold the valve open. It's a somewhat significant amount too. Most of these solenoids operate at 12 volts and draw about one amp of current when the valve is open. If you only have it open while using the stove, it probably won't add up to too much. But if you have your heater running through the night and into the morning, let's say for 10 hours, then that's 10 amp hours, which is more power than the fan of my heater uses itself. And that's ultimately why I didn't add a solenoid valve to my system. In the winter, when we need more propane for the heat, the sun is also less abundant. So if you do want to add a solenoid valve, be sure to calculate this into your power budget. When I want to cut off the flow of propane to the rest of the system, I just reach into the locker and close the valve at the tank itself. As you are finishing up your install and have everything connected, you need to check for leaks. The easiest way to do this is to get a spray bottle and fill it with soapy water. A mix of dish soap and water works well for this. If you don't have a spray bottle, you can also brush the soapy water on. Once you have the soapy spray ready, open the valve on the propane tank to pressurize the system. Then one by one, spray the soapy solution onto the connections and fittings and valves. If there is a leak, the soap will start to bubble up quite a bit. Fix any leaks you find. I had a couple leaky connections when I first connected my system, but those problem fittings just needed to be tightened up a bit more. After completing this check, you can have the peace of mind that your system is leak free. In addition to this, as I mentioned before, don't forget to install a propane alarm because even if it's not leaking at first, leaks can develop further down the road. Okay, so that's about all I have in terms of the components and the installation. As I mentioned in the beginning, I want to comment on using diesel as an alternate fuel source for cooking and heating appliances. If you have a diesel vehicle, like a Sprinter, then these make more sense. You can source them from the vehicle's tank, which means you don't have to install an additional tank that takes up space. If you don't have a diesel vehicle, then this gets a little more complicated, although there are some gasoline variants available for the appliances I'm about to mention but I don't think they are quite as readily available. There are many diesel heaters available though, and there are some which can work for heating both air and water in campers. There are also some diesel cooktops available. Some of these units, like the heaters, are meant to be mounted inside, but some of the larger combination units are mounted underneath. In all cases, all combustion fumes stay outside the vehicle. I don't have any experience with any of these units, but I know Wabasto is one brand which makes a wide variety of them. One thing I hear you want to watch out for with diesel heaters is that some of them can have issues when you run them at higher altitudes. So if you go this route, that's something you want to look into. Many of the heaters can be adjusted for use at higher altitudes, and there's even some higher end models that have an automatic altitude adjustment. Some of these diesel appliances can be quite expensive though. A popular diesel cooktop is the Wabasto X100, which sells for just over $1,200 at the time of making this video. A nice propane cooktop will only cost around $200, and there's cheaper propane camp stoves that can be used as well. For the forced air diesel heaters, there are cheaper Chinese-made units available that many people are quite happy with. You may also be wondering about powering everything from electricity and skipping a gas fuel source altogether. You can certainly find electric induction cooktops, electric space heaters, and electric water heaters, but all of these consume very large amounts of power. So unless you plan to either use a generator, have a constant shore power hookup, 
or just have a massive solar array, battery bank, and inverter, then you'll probably want to look outside of electricity for generating heat. So that covers what I put together for this video. I hope you found it useful and informative for planning out and building your own campers. If you enjoy my videos, please give them a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I hope everyone is staying safe and staying healthy. See you next time. Bye.